Our speaker for this uh, session is Matthew O. Richardson. Brother Richardson is a professor of church history and doctrine at Brigham Young University. He is currently serving as second counselor in the General Sunday School Presidency. I'll turn the time over to Brother Richardson. It is truly a pleasure to be here with you this evening, and I hope and pray that our time together might be profitable. The restoration of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints included the authoritative reinstitution of the ordinance of the sacrament. The Lord instructed the saints that it is expedient that the Church meet together often to participate in the sacramental ordinance. Now, most references dealing with the sacrament in the Doctrine and Covenants address the administrative aspects of this ordinance. For example, the scripture addresses the authority required to perform the ordinance, sacramental emblems, prayers, and the frequency of partaking of the sacrament, and even the personal preparation for participation therein are outlined. Such instruction is vital in maintaining the veracity of this sacred ordinance, but if we are not careful, we may focus too much on, on the text dealing with the administering of the ordinance alone, and thus we may overshadow the possibilities of recognizing additional insights, the understandings of broader purposes, and receiving untapped blessings connected with the sacrament. Now, when considering how the sacrament is represented in the scriptural text of the Restoration, section 27 of the Doctrine and Covenants makes a very unique contribution. It connects other textual concept, concepts and administrative aspects of the sacrament by constructing a framework for understanding and applying the sacrament. The power of this revelatory text, however, is accessed only when its various parts are connected and integrated one with another. So tonight we will examine how the text of section 27 uniquely connects the three purposes of the sacrament, namely directing our attention to remembering our deliverance, inviting us to look forward to our future, and finally showing us how the sacrament provides both safety and protection in how we are presently living our lives. The presentation and eventual publication of the revelatory text now known as DNC section 27 are an instructive example of how scriptural principles and practices are actually revealed and how they are connected line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. Now keeping this in mind helps us understand the powerful connections between these three different sacramental purposes or in Nephi's words, those three lines and or precepts. According to Joseph Smith's account, this revelation was received when Newell Knight and his wife Sally visited Joseph and Emma Smith in Harmony, Pennsylvania in August of 1830. During the course of their visit, it was proposed that Sally and Emma, who were previously baptized, would be uh, confirmed members of the church, and then afterwards the group would partake of the sacrament together. Joseph left his home to find wine for the sacrament service and was met by a heavenly messenger. Now, Joseph later recounted that he recorded the first paragraph of the revelation and then recorded the remainder of the revelation the following September. Now, the first paragraph described by Joseph first appeared in the Evening and Morning Star in March of 1833. That very same paragraph was also included in the 1833 Book of Commandments as section 28. While the majority of the text deals with the safety of procuring and using acceptable sacramental emblems, this text outlines, albeit briefly, the three sacramental purposes for us to better understand and apply the sacrament, remembering the past, looking forward to the future, and protecting our, and how we are living presently. While the first paragraph of the revelation Joseph received was recorded in the early text, the rest of the revelation was not published until 1835 as section 50 in the first edition of the Doctrine and Covenants. The 1835 edition of the Doctrine and Covenants expanded the 1833 paragraph or revelation by 457 words. Now, our current text of section 27 of the Doctrine and Covenants is nearly identical to the 1835 expansion. And rather than adding new concepts or purposes to the original publication, the expanded text added considerable detail to the purposes of looking forward to our future redemption and to providing safety and protection in how we live our lives. So let's begin our consideration with the first sacramental purpose, namely directing our attention to the past. 
The Doctrine and Covenants emphasizes that the sacrament is a ritual for remembering the genesis of our deliverance, or in other words, the atonement and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In April of 1830, for example, it was revealed to Joseph that partaking of the bread was to be in remembrance of the body of thy son, and that the drinking of the wine was to be in remembrance of the blood of thy son. With this sacred ritual, we are to direct our thoughts partly to an upper room in ancient Jerusalem, to a nearby grove of olive trees known as the Garden of Gethsemane, to Golgotha, and then to the nearby garden tomb as we remember the associated events. Remembering is a powerful and it's a necessary experience. In fact, President Spencer W. Kimball once said that the most important word in the dictionary could be the word remember. He explained the power of this word as he said, quote, I suppose there would never be an apostate. There would never be a crime if people remembered, really remembered the things they had covenanted at the water's edge or at the sacrament table and in the temple. I suppose that it is the reason, that is the reason the Lord asked Adam to offer sacrifice for no other reason than that he and his posterity would remember. Remember the basic things that they had been taught. End of quote. While the sacrament prayers revealed in Doctrine and Covenants section 20 instruct us to remember the atonement and the resurrection, section 27 provides an additional witness that the sacrament is a time for remembering unto the Father Christ's body, which was laid down for you, and Christ's blood, which was shed for the remission of your sins. As important as the additional witness of this point is, the text in section 27 provides vital instruction about the importance of the value of tokens or emblems in sharpening our focus in our remembrance. It was revealed to Joseph Smith that, quote, it mattereth not what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink when ye partake of the sacrament, end of quote. While this may appear to be simple administrative detail, it actually underscores the vital purpose of the sacrament itself, to completely focus, on our, focus our thoughts on the events leading to our deliverance. This textual passage actually underscores that the emblems used for sacramental worship are just that, emblems. And as such, their purpose is nothing more and nothing less than for turning our attention to a greater event, to focus our thoughts and our feelings, and to remember the past in such a way that it not only makes it relevant, but it makes it very real. Now, some delight in discovering that it mattereth not what emblems are to be used for sacrament. Their delight is tempered, however, when they realize that sacramental emblems are not on the focus of our palatable pleasure or our amusement, but symbols that are intended exclusively to help us focus on the atonement and resurrection of Jesus Christ. For behold, verse 2 teaches, It mattereth not what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink when ye partake of the sacrament if, and this is a very important transition, if it so be that ye do it with an eye single to my glory, remembering unto the Father my body which was laid down for you, and my blood which was shed for the remission of your sins. In truth, the value of this emblem, whatever it may be, is determined only by how well it helps us to remember and focus on the atonement and the res resurrection of our Savior. This means that any emblem, including the bread or the water, which distracts from the singular purpose of reminding us that it is the Savior's atonement, then it would be ineffective, or in other words, it would be used in vain if it distracts from that purpose. As such, those who prepare and those who pass the emblems of the sacred sacrament must be vigilant in their duty, for they may unwittingly distract from the sacrament ritual in the way that they prepare, the way that they bless, and the way they present the sacred sacramental emblems. President Spencer W. Kimball taught, quote, I guess we as humans are prone to forget. It is easy to forget. Our sorrows, our joys, our concerns, our great problems seem to wane to some extent as time goes on, and there are many lessons that we learn which have a tendency to slip from us." End of quote. Tokens or emblems sharpen our focus, and through these tangible connectors, they help us remember events 
and concepts that we hope never to forget. For example, many married couples exchange and wear rings as an emblem or a symbol, a token of their marriage. This particular emblem shows others that a person is married, but even more importantly, it reminds the married person of <clears throat> his or her spouse and what is expected of a married person. Thus, when glancing at a wedding band, vivid memories and feelings return to the day when covenants were made. Remembering that event may actually inspire married individuals to renew their efforts and act accordingly. In this way, tokens or emblems symbolize something from the past and reconnect the past with the present in tangible and meaningful ways. We should remember that the sacrament is a consecrated event. Therefore, we must remember and focus on the past just as covenant Israel did during the Passover. They intentionally looked to their past and remembered how they were miraculously delivered from captivity, oppression, angst, and despair. Likewise, Latter-day Saints look to the past and they remember the events that miraculously deliver them from their captivity, oppression, angst, and despair in any type and form. The atonement is the genesis of our redemption, and if the present and future do not connect with the atonement, the future and the present hold very little prospect. Remembering the past is only effectual if it informs future events. Covenant Israel, for example, used the Passover to remember their great day of deliverance. But perhaps they failed to use the Passover's lessons from the past to inform and direct their view for the future redemption. And as a result, they did not recognize the Savior himself and they cru crucified him instead of receiving him wholeheartedly. Likewise, Latter-day Saints may use the sacrament to remember the past and the atonement, but then fail to use the sacrament to inform and direct their attention to a time when they might be with the Savior when he comes again. President John Taylor pointed out this crucial relationship between the past and the future as he said, quote, For in partaking of the sacrament, we not only commemorate the death of the sufferings of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but... We also shadow forth the time when he will come again and when we shall meet and eat bread with him in the kingdom of God, end of quote. Directing our mind to the future has always been a key component of the sacrament. For example, as Jesus Christ first instituted the sacramental wine during his mortal ministry, he said to his apostles, but I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Even at that very first sacramental meeting, the Savior was encouraging his disciples to look forward with anticipation to a future meeting when Jesus and his disciples would gather together again and partake of the sacrament anew. Now, nearly 1,800 years later, the Savior provided almost the exact same type of instruction to his Latter-day disciples. After teaching about the emblems of the sacrament and of the importance of remembering the Savior's atonement, the 1833 text of section 50, which is now Doctrine and Covenants section 27, immediately turns our attention to the future. It reads, quote, Behold, this is wisdom in me, Wherefore marvel not, for the hour cometh, that I will drink of the fruit of the vine with you on the earth and with all those whom my Father hath given me out of the world. End of quote. Now here the Lord speaks of his eventual return and a time when he will partake of the sacrament again. Just like the first sacrament in Jerusalem, Jesus is still urging his disciples to remember the past and look to the future. In the later published versions of this revelation, 70% of the words added were actually details pertaining to this future sacramental meeting. The principle of looking forward to and partaking of the sacrament with the Savior is still the focal point, but now more details were given of this event. Joseph Smith was informed that he would be present at this meeting, this future meeting, as well as other recognized individuals. Section 27 specifically names other participants at this future sacramental meeting, such as Moroni, Elisha, John the Baptist, Elijah, 
Jacob, Joseph, Isaac, Abraham, Michael, or Adam, Peter, James, and John. Pretty impressive guest list. We would assume from Matthew's account in the New Testament of the first sacramental meeting that those who were present with the Savior to drink the sacrament new would be there as well. In fact, Elder Bruce R. McConkie also included at this gathering, quote, those who have held the keys and powers and authorities in all ages from Adam to present, close quote. Among all those listed in the later publication, we must not forget that group mentioned in both 1833 and the 1835 plus publications of this revelation. This is the group known as all those who my Father hath given me out of the world. Now the wording here is reminiscent of Christ's great discourse and his intercessory prayer that was given just prior to the atonement in Gethsemane. At that time Christ said, quote, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. For they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine and I am glorified in them." End of quote. These individual are, individuals are the very same group that Christ specifically called the men and women which thou hast gave us, that thou gavest me out of the world in just three verses earlier in John 17, 6. Now think about this. In his discourse and prayer, Christ described this group or these individuals as those who bear witness of him, remember him, allow the Comforter or Holy Ghost to come upon them and to guide them in all truth and to show them all things to come. Christ said that these are they who received the name of God and kept his word. For me, the wording and phrases used here to describe those given out of the world neatly describe and align with those who worthily and properly partake of the sacramental covenants. As such, we find wonderful connections with the sacrament prayers revealed to Joseph Smith in April of 1830. These prayers also contain words and phrases like, witness unto thee, in remembrance of, do always remember him, willing to take upon them the name of thy son, keep his commandments which he has given them, and that they may always have his spirit to be with them. When considering the future meeting where prophets of all ages and those given out of the world will partake of the sacrament with the Savior once again, it appears that this meeting will include those who have entered into covenants and who worthily participate in the sacramental ordinance. In fact, Elder Bruce R. McConkie described those given out of the world in section 27 to be, quote, all the faithful members of the church then living and all the faithful saints of the ages past, end of quote. No wonder Elder McConkie described this future, sac future sacramental gathering with the Savior as, quote, the greatest congregation of faithful saints ever assembled on the planet Earth, end of quote. Now for some, it may be difficult to pinpoint when this sacramental meeting spoken of in section 27 will actually take place. You know, Elder Bruce R. McConkie, when speaking on the subject, taught, quote, before the Lord Jesus descends openly and publicly in the clouds of glory, attended by all the hosts of heaven, before the great and dreadful day of the Lord when he sends terror and destruction from one er end of the earth to the other, before he stands on Mount Zion or sets his feet on all of it, or utters his voice from American Zion or a Jewish Jerusalem, before all flesh shall see him together before any of his appearances, which, take, uh, which taken together comprise the second coming of the Son of God. Before all these, there was to be a secret appearance to selected members of his church, end of quote. He then said that this secret appearance, that it will, quote, be a sacrament meeting. It will be a day of judgment for the faithful of all ages, and it will take place in Davies County, Missouri, at the place called Adam on Die Amen. Close quote. Now, I don't know why, but I always want to sing right there. Adam on Die Amen. It just seems fitting. So, after singing and directing our attention to the past and then to the future, section 27 teaches that the sacrament should also cause us to consider our present day and our current conduct. 
This should not be surprising, as it has been said that the Doctrine and Covenants was meant, to, meant in part as a current guide to how Latter-day Saints should live their religion. In the 1833 publication of this revelation, the final verse read, Wherefore, lift up your hearts and rejoice, and gird up your loins, and be faithful until I come. Now, the later publications of this revelation added 136 words, nearly 30% of all the additions to this very final theme, giving it a more robust approach to using the sacrament as a means for real-time protection and for real-time safety. When considering the additions, we now read the original 1833 text as, Wherefore, lift up your hearts and rejoice, and gird up your loins, and take upon you my whole armor, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all, that ye may be able to stand. Several additional verses are then included in this text that deal directly with the armor of God. I realize there are some who interpret this passage as merely additional witness of Paul's writings about the importance of the armor of God. However, if this segment is directly connected with the sacrament and the other purposes thereof, then these additional verses dealing with the armor of God provide a deeper insight on how the sacrament protects us and prepares us for the future. The connection of this final purpose with the sacrament, with the other two purposes of remembering our past, looking forward to the future, um, they, uh, they are found, actually, the connection is found in the wording, the textual wording of the revelation itself. For example, this final section begins with the word wherefore in verse 15. In 1828, the word wherefore was commonly defined as for which reason, which means because of this. Thus, after describing the future meeting with Jesus Christ to partake of the sacrament, which was in verses 5 through 14, the very next verse could be read as for which reason or because of these verses, meaning verses 5 through 14, you should lift up your voice and lift up your hearts and rejoice and gird up your loins and take upon you my whole armor so that ye may be able to withstand the evil day, having done all, that ye may be able to stand. You see, in this way, verses 5 through 14 are directly connected to verses 5 through 18. This is the pattern that is also used earlier in the Revelation connecting the first two purposes of the sacrament together. Consider how the text outlines the sacramental purpose of using the emblems to remember the past events of our deliverance and then recall that the very next verse states, quote, Behold, it is wisdom in me, wherefore, now we go back to the 1828 version, or because of this purpose, we must marvel not. For the hour cometh that I will come and drink the fruit of the, wine, of the vine with you on the earth. You see, these direct connections are important because rather than considering this revelation as three independent purposes, principles, precepts, or practices, we can now see that each purpose is textually connected to the other. In other words, the only way to be worthy of and qualify for the future sacramental meeting or our own personal redemption is for us to remember the past events of the atonement and the res resurrection and then to lift our hearts, rejoice, gird up our loins, and put on the armor of God today. Richard Lloyd Anderson pointed out, quote, for through remembering Jesus' past sacrifice, we promise to transform our own lives in preparation for an eternal or an eternal future with him, end of quote. With, the, with an established connection between the sacrament of the, and the armor of God, we can now see vivid ways how the sacrament actually protects us. It is important to remember that Christ described those given out of the world with those attributes that are directly associated to the sacramental covenants. Remember, we talked about bearing witness of him, of being able to have the Holy Ghost with them, to bear the name of God, to keep the commandments, etc. And, he, and then he said that such individuals were not of this world. In his intercessory prayer, Christ prayed that the Father would not take these individuals out of the world, 
Now this is an interesting phrase, but instead keep them from the evil and to sanctify them through thy truth. Obviously, the sanctifying power spoken of here can only come through Jesus Christ's atonement and his resurrection. That is obvious. As for keeping the saints from evil, consider how Elder Howard W. Hunter re referred to the Passover as, quote, an ancient covenant of protection, end of quote. And in similar manner, he referred to the sacrament as, quote, the new covenant of safety, end of quote. So according to section 27, the armor of God is intended to protect the saints so they might withstand the evil day and ultimately stand with Christ in the end. Making additional connections between the sacrament and the armor of God actually provides unique insights to the protecting power of the sacred covenant and, and is worthy, I believe, of further examination and consideration. You see, while the Apostle Paul used the imagery of physical armor, he was very clear that he wasn't speaking about physical protection as much as spiritual protection. Quote, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, Paul wrote, but against the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness. End of quote. Harold Harold B. Lee offered more detailed explanation regarding the symbolism of the armor of God, which lays a foundation for making sacramental co uh, connections as well. Elder Lee explained, quote, We have the four parts of the body that are most vulnerable to the powers of darkness. The loins, typifying virtue or chastity. The heart, typifying our conduct. Our feet, our goals or objectives in life, and finally, our head or our thoughts, close quote. With this important symbolism in our minds, we are now in a position to see the powerful connection between the armor of God and the sacrament. The helmet of salvation, for example. The helmet is designed to protect the head or the brain during physical combat. Without such protection, a serious wound to the head is deadly. According to Elder Lee, in spiritual warfare, the helmet is to protect one's thoughts. Obviously then, if our thoughts are unprotected, our thoughts can likewise be spiritually fatal. According to section 27, the best way to protect our thoughts is with salvation. To understand how salvation can protect our thoughts, consider how King Benjamin taught that salvation comes by no other name or means save Jesus Christ. Thus, as we partake the sacrament, we don the helmet of salvation by covenanting to remember Jesus Christ. Jesus encouraged us to look unto him in every thought, doubt not and fear not. The sacrament helps us with this protection as our thoughts are first turned to the atonement and to the resurrection. This makes it possible for us to consider our future redemption in Christ. This, in turn, provides opportunity for candid evaluation of our present condition. The sacrament firmly places the helmet of salvation upon those entering into this covenant as they covenant they will always remember him, of course, meaning Jesus Christ. Think how differently our actions would be if they were always preceded by the thoughts of the Savior on how he lived and what he would have us do. With our eyes single to him in our remembrance of the past, by remembering him in all we do every day, our thoughts are protected in such a way as to secure our glorious future. Consider the breastplate of righteousness. A physical breastplate is designed to protect the heart and the lungs, both life-sustaining organs. Now, according to Elder Lee, the spiritual breastplate protects our conduct, our conduct. It is critical to point out that it is not our conduct that protects our righteousness, but in this text, our righteousness that protects our conduct. This might appear to be a matter of semantics to some, but it is much more than merely haggling over words. Elder David A. Bednar, for example, points out that, quote, it is possible for us to have clean hands, but not have a pure heart, close quote. A person without a righteous character might engage in appropriate activities, but that in, that in and of itself may not afford the protection needed to withstand the evil day. 
Of course, righteous character cannot be obtained or even sustained without righteous conduct. I hope that's clear. Elder Bednar reasoned, quote, both clean hands and a pure heart are required to ascend into the hill of the Lord and to stand in his holy place, end of quote. As such, the way to obtaining the character of righteousness is, as Elder Bednar points out, quote, through the process of putting off the natural man and by overcoming sin and the evil influences in our lives through the Savior's atonement. He went on to clarify that hearts are purified as we receive his strengthening power to do good and become better. All of our worthy desires, as necessary as they are, can never produce clean hands and a pure heart. It is the atonement of Jesus Christ that, both, that provides both a cleansing and redeeming power that helps us to overcome sin and a sanctifying and strengthening power that helps us to become better than we could ever by, um, that we could ever by relying only upon our own strength. I love this last part. The infinite atonement is for both the sinner and for the saint in each of us, end of quote. You see, Doctrine and Covenants, section 27, and in verse 15 instructs every person to take upon you the Lord's whole armor so that ye may be able to withstand the evil day, having done all that ye may be able to stand. It then reads, stand therefore, having on the breastplate of righteousness. It is hard to think of anything more foundational in forging and securing the breastplate of righteousness than the sacrament itself. Paul taught that obedience yields righteousness. As such, all who partake of the sacrament covenant to keep the commandments which he, meaning God, has given them. Thus, we pledge to become righteous through obeying the commandments that God has given. Now, obviously, this requires an omission from wrongdoing, but the commandments of God are not limited to proscriptions only. As we avoid the things of the world, we must also seek for the things of a better. Elder Bednar described this process as the dual requirements of first avoiding and overcoming bad and second doing good and becoming better. These dual requirements are at the core or at the very heart of establishing and maintaining the character of our righteousness. But it is not enough to only have clean hands for our hearts must also be pure, a condition only made possible, as Elder Bednar pointed out, by accepting and applying the atoning, atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Once again, it is the sacrament that empowers us to embrace the altering powers of the atonement that focus our obedience and, our change, and changes our disposition as well. You see, Elder Bednar pointed out that, quote, this mighty change is not simply the result of working harder or developing greater individual discipline, Rather, it is a consequence of a, of a fundamental change in our desires, our motives, and our natures made possible through the atonement of Christ the Lord. Close quote. More than mere de determination, it is our righteous character that literally protects our conduct. Consider, for example, young Joseph while he was a prisoner in Egypt. Undoubtedly, he was an obedient disciple and diligently kept the commandments of God. Undoubtedly. It is clear that his character aligned with his devoted obedience. When, with Potiphar's, when Potiphar's wife tempted him to act in ways that were contrary to the commandments of God, Joseph did not respond with, I am not allowed, or this type of activity is against my religion, or I'm not supposed to participate in those types of things. Instead, Joseph outrightly refused, and he queried, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Joseph's reaction wasn't so much a product of determined obedience as much it was a reflection of his integrity, his very being, of who he really was. His refusal actually meant something like, I, meaning the type of person that I am, cannot do this type of thing. It was against his very nature his very character to do such things. So you see, it was Joseph's righteousness that protected his conduct. A sacramental covenant to keep the commandment protects the choices made by willing disciples. 
It's critical. And it blesses and protects us. Consider the girdle of truth. God's armor also includes a girdle protecting the loins, another part of the body that has mortal implica implications. Spiritually speaking, the loins represent our virtue or our chastity, which, according to section 27, is best protected by truth. In a world that condones promiscuity, openness, and indulgence, one may suppose that the best way to protect virtue and our chastity would be with strict abstinence, abhorrence, or maybe even strict seclusion. Let's go hide in a cave. Yet in his infinite wisdom, the Lord revealed that the best way to protect our virtue and to be able to protect our chastity is with knowing the truth. In a world awash with an everything goes attitude, Elder Henry B. Eyring said that sin is, quote, presented incessantly and attractively. He added that sin doesn't even look like a sea of filth to the young people swimming in it. In fact, they may not even be swimming because the presentation is so incessant and so attractive that they may not notice that there is a need to swim, end of quote. In reality, Satan's presentation is alluring to those who are unaware or unsure of the truth. That is why temptation is especially effective with those who have not yet entrenched themselves on the Lord's side and are teetering with their allegiance. President Spencer W. Kimball reminded us that, quote, the Savior said the very elect would be deceived by Lucifer if it were possible. He will use his logic to confuse and his rationalizations to destroy. He will shade meanings, open the doors an inch at a time, and lead from purest um, white through all shades of gray to the darkest black. Young people are confused by the arch deceiver who uses every device to deceive them, end of quote. It isn't surprising that the father of all, all lies uses biology, psychology, and sociology to justify immoral behavior. Satan's despicable betrayal of a tolerant virtue and a new chastity seems to be of tidal wave proportions and on the brink of consuming everything and everyone in its path. Thus leaders, parents, disciples wonders, uh, wonder if anything can protect their children, their congregations, and their friends from the impending moral doom and deception. President Ezra Taft Benson taught, quote, the law of chastity is a principle of eternal significance. We must not be swayed by the many voices of the world. We must listen to the voice of the Lord, and then we will set our feet irrevocably upon the path which he has marked, end of quote. You see, long ago, during his mortal ministry, Jesus Christ taught his disciples that, quote, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, close quote. In a world filled with deception and lies on every side, wouldn't a guide to point out the truth in every circumstance be most effective and gratefully received? The sacrament serves to secure such a personal guide. Those who make worthy sacramental covenants pledge to live their lives in such a way that, quote, they may always have his spirit to be with them, close quote. Whether through the scriptures, the living prophets, or personal revelation, the voice of the Lord is manifest in our mind and in our heart by the Holy Ghost, which was sent forth to teach us the truth. Nephi taught them, in addition to telling and teaching the truth, that the Holy Ghost will, and I love this, this line, quote, will show unto you all things what you should do, close quote. Once again, it is the sacrament that can add yet another piece of God's armor to protect and sac uh, sanctify the saints in all things, in all places, and at all times. Now, what about our feet? It may be surprising to some and to many that the soldier or a soldier whose feet are not shod may be in mortal peril. Many do not place shoes in the same category as a helmet, a breastplate, or even the girdle. Yet shoes are just as vital in warfare as the other pieces of armor. You see, this particular piece of armor is protective in a different way. Rather than protecting the foot itself, it is actually protecting the function of the foot. 
A soldier's mobility in battle is crucial to his success. If a warrior is unable to advance or adjust to the, the terrain of a battle or even retreat, then his chances of survival are slim. In Roman times, soldiers were issued hobnailed sandals. These are sandals that had nails driven through the soles and could be the ancient equivalent of what we today call cleats. Hobnailed shoes gave a soldier an advantage of sure traction and also increased mobility. The armor of God also includes having our feet, or as Elder Lee pointed out, our goals and our objectives to be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace that was sent by the angels. This means that our goals, our plans for the future, the objectives of our life and how we plan to live it are directed and given traction by being prepared in the gospel as sent by an angel, or in other words, by the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. Once again, it is difficult to find a platform that helps us develop such preparation derived from the restored gospel of Jesus Christ better than the sacrament. Those who worthily partake of the sacrament actually covenant to be, quote, willing to take upon them the name of the Son, end of quote. Taking the name of Christ upon us is more than merely accepting a label or a brand of worship. This is much more than saying, I am a Christian or I am a Latter-day Saint. In the very beginning, Adam was commanded, Thou shalt do all that thou doest in the name of the Son. The, thus, those willing and those who are willing to take upon them the name of Christ are willing to do more than just receive a namesake. They are willing to do whatever Christ does. Like Christ, they too begin to wrestle with ultimate discipleship as he experienced in Gethsemane when Christ perfectly aligned his will with the Father's will. Father, Christ prayed, if thou will be willing, remove this cup from me. You see, here we see the demonstration of ultimate discipleship as Christ said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. All disciples of Christ pass through similar challenges in submitting their will to God's will and in unifying their will with his. Those willing to act as Christ did find that their desires, hopes, and plans to take on a greater, even a broader context. Their preparation in his gospel influences every thought, every motive, every feeling, every perception, and every goal. C.S. Lewis, I like to say Brother Lewis, I think he's joined. C.S. Lewis once said, quote, I believe in Christianity as I believe in the sun, uh, believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else, end of quote. This type of preparation is directly connected with our sacramental covenant to take Christ's name upon us. Elder Dallin H. Oak taught that, quote, our willingness to take upon us the name of Jesus Christ affirms our commitment to do all that we can to be counted among those whom he will choose to stand at his right hand and be called by his name at the last day. In this sacred sense, our witness that we are willing to take upon us the name of Jesus Christ constitutes our declaration of candidacy for the exaltation in the celestial kingdom. End of quote. Thus, we must be vigilant that we never neglect our baptismal and sacramental covenants of taking Christ's name upon us, or else we risk taking Christ's name in vain. Section 27 of the Doctrine and Covenants provides illuminating instruction concerning the sacrament. It helps us remember the past, look to the future, and to focus on how we are presently living our lives. The sacrament protects us and preserves us by helping us don the armor of God and evaluate our standing each and every week through specific covenants. Thus, through the sacrament, the transforming powers of the atonement changes our very character. When we do more than just go through the motions, the sacrament can infuse the power and protection of the atonement into our very character. At that ultimate stage, Elder Bruce C. Hafen explained, we will exhibit divine characteristics not just because we think we should, but because that is the way we are. You see, as we embrace the sacrament as a ritual that is sacred and holy, we find peace, power, and contentment. 
I testify that that is true. Peace, power, and contentment as it connects us with the past, with our present, and with our, de de our destiny or our future. Elder Oaks writes, quote, any who may have thought it a small thing to partake of the sacrament should remember the Lord's declaration that the foundation of a great work is laid by small things. He then concludes by saying, out of, small, out of the seemingly small act of consciously and reverently renewing our baptismal covenants comes a renewal of the blessings of baptism by water and by the Spirit, that we may always have His Spirit to be with us. In this way, all of us will be guided, and in this way, all of us can be cleansed." End of quote. Brothers and sisters, I add my witness to His that Jesus truly is the Christ, that He has provided a miraculous atonement and a wonderful resurrection. That the sacrament binds us to remembering that glorious or those glorious events, encourages us and gives us hope for our personal future and standing with him. But as we partake of the sacrament, I testify the armor of God can be donned and utilized in our daily living. Of this I testify in the sacred name, even Jesus Christ, amen. We'd like to thank Brother Richardson for his presentation and thank you for being with us tonight. The next session of this symposium will start in about 15 minutes. <laughs>